Well, it is, it is so good to be with you guys this morning as we begin, if this is your first Sunday, you picked a good Sunday, we're beginning a, a brand new sermon series going through the book of Colossians for the next eight weeks or so. We'll be in the book of Colossians together and the title of the sermon series is Jesus Over All. And now if you've been a, a part of our church for really any amount of time, even if today is your first Sunday and you came here and you got some coffee, uh, you probably saw our core values as a church. And when we talk about our core values as a church, we're talking about the things that we strive to be all about, right? These are things that, that we want to be, what, uh, what motivates all of our actions uh, are these kind of values. These are the things that we are striving to be known for. It doesn't mean we're, we're there perfectly. It doesn't mean we live all these things out without fail, but these are the things that we wanna be known for. And not only as a church, but if you're a part of this church family. These are things that we want to be a part of your lives that define your life as well. And our first core value as a church and really our, our most important core value, because if we don't get this one right, none of the other ones matter anyway, is that we are all about Jesus. Like we want to be a church that is, that is rooted, built all about Jesus. And the thing I love about the book of Colossians is really this just kind of reaffirms our first core value. It, it kind of brings us back because the theme that we're gonna see all throughout the book of Colossians is that Christ is supreme over all else, that, that everything is about Jesus. We're gonna see that kind of theme mentioned time and time again over these next eight weeks. And so this morning, as we begin this series, we're gonna be in Colossians chapter one, verses one through 14. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And again, I would encourage you. I know we always have the Bible on the screen. We have the scripture on the screen and you have the Bible on your phone, but I would encourage you, bring a Bible with you, bring something to take notes on, right? Uh, so that you can actually go back and study this with us afterwards as well. Because I know I talk for really long, but I also know I talk really fast at times as well. So it's always good to kind of go back and study this for yourself. But we're gonna jump right in this morning. We're gonna look at the very first two verses as we begin the kind of introduction of this letter. And we're gonna go from there. And so it says in verses one through two, to Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We find out in these first couple verses a lot of information about what this letter is all about. We find out that this is a letter written by the apostle Paul to the church in a city called Colossae, to the saints and the believers in that church for them. Now, when you study the history of this, this letter was probably written sometime between 60 and 62 AD during Paul's time in prison in Rome. We looked at that and talked about that when we studied the book of Acts, but there was four letters that he wrote that we refer to as the prison letters or the prison epistles. They were during that period of time in history, the letters of Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon, and the letter of Colossians, all written during that period of time. And as we study this letter, what we're gonna find out is that Paul most likely never had even been to the city of Colossae. He'd never been there and done any ministry there that most likely this church was formed during Paul's third missionary journey. And we talked about this, I believe in Acts 20, but during Paul's third missionary journey, he was in Ephesus and he was there for an extended period of time around three years doing ministry, preaching the gospel. And the Bible says that during that period of time, not only did the gospel transform the city of Ephesus, but it transformed all of Asia Minor, what is present day Turkey, he was considered Asia Minor at that time. And it transformed all over Asia Minor that many of the cities all over Asia Minor heard the gospel and were transformed. And Colossae was most likely one of those cities. It was located about a hundred miles to the east on the Lycus River from Ephesians. It was uh, surrounded by other churches that you hear about in scripture, uh, Laodicea and Hierapolis, also cities that were probably had churches that were all started by a man named Epaphras. He was probably a man who heard the gospel preached preached in Ephesus by the apostle Paul. And he took this message as a missionary and church planner to the city, maybe the city he grew up in, Colossae. And he brought the gospel message there and planted a church in this city. And so this is a, a city that at one point in time in its history was like a thriving city, most likely before the period of time that Paul is writing. It was a thriving city. It was a big city in the trade route between Ephesus and the rest of the East and South from there. Uh, but no longer is it a booming city a booming metropolis. At this point in time, it's, it's actually more like a small town. 
It's a small town with a thriving church. In fact, it's so small that many believe that this is probably the, the least significant church that Paul addresses in any of his letters. But the reason that he reaches out to them, the reason that he writes to them was really, really important. Because even though God did, was doing a work in Colossae and it had started off really well and there was great ministry taking place there, eventually what started to take root was some false teaching. It was getting away from the core message of the gospel and there was some distortions beginning to take place. And, and many believe that Epaphras had visited Paul while he was in Rome, while he was under house arrest, and he brings him this message about the, the church, this update on what's going on in the church in Colossae. And he talks to him about some of these false teaching and things that are taking place. And Paul writes this letter in response to what Epaphras told him about the church to kind of combat some of the false teaching. Now, we don't know exactly what the false teaching was. Scholars refer to it as the Colossian heresy, right? They, like a very fancy, this is the Colossian heresy, but there was no like, here's what it was. We can gather what it was by looking at what Paul addresses. We're gonna talk about this over these next eight weeks. He addresses some of these different things, but what we see is that this heresy that was being taught or that was taking root in Colossae was, was really, it was, a, it was like syncretism. Meaning syncretism is like when you take a bunch of different things, different ideas, Ideas, different religious thoughts, some Christianity, some new age stuff, right? Some religious experiences, all this different kind of stuff. And you just kind of throw it into a big blender. And then all of a sudden out comes something that's completely different than what it was meant to be. And so what we see is that that's what was taking place in, in Colossae. It wasn't just about Jesus. It wasn't just about the gospel. And what we're going to see because of what Paul addresses, there's some elements of, of man-made religion. There's some elements of philosophy. There's some elements of worship of angels angels and visions. There's some Jewish mysticism. There's some uh, asceticism that's talked about. And asceticism was essentially just a, a form of self-denial or even self-harm that was, was taught that you needed to do in order to reach like a higher level, right? And so you would go through extreme forms of fasting or, or abusing your body in order to like help yourself reach a new spiritual level. It was taking what Jesus talked about when it comes to denying yourself to a completely unholy level level, a bad level where you were focusing more on the act than the God that you were trying to serve. And so there was levels of that taking place there. And then probably the biggest thing that was taking place there was Gnosticism. And Gnosticism as a religious thought wasn't even fully fully formed at this time, but the beginnings of it were already starting to take place and to take root. And really Gnosticism was one of the, the biggest threats to Christianity in the first century. And Gnosticism, without getting into all the details of it, is essentially just all about that fuller knowledge, that fuller revelation. Not that you can find in Christ, but that you have to have these outward experiences, these mystic experiences, and that you can reach a certain plane of enlightenment, right? But it's all outside of the Bible. The Bible is not enough. Jesus is not enough. You need to have these other experiences. Only a few people can reach this level. And, and so that was also taking root there. And what we really see in, in Colossae was that it was no longer about just Jesus. What started as the gospel, what started as just Jesus now was Jesus plus self-denial, Jesus plus uh, you know, religious experiences, Jesus plus visions and, and angels and worshiping these things, Jesus plus a higher level of, of knowledge or enlightenment that can only be experienced by a few. It was Jesus plus all these other things. And here's what we've said time and time again, is that any time we try to add to the gospel, add to the requirements of Jesus, add to anything, but anytime it's Jesus plus anything, it's actually nothing. It's no longer the gospel, right? Jesus plus anything else is, is nothing. And that's what we're seeing here. And the reason I think this is so important for us today is the same things all by maybe different names we still see in our culture, in our world. It's always Jesus plus other things. And anytime we get away from the, the reality of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, the supremacy of Christ in the gospel, we run into danger. And so we're gonna talk about this throughout this series. Now, we're gonna see Paul addressing this all through the next eight weeks, but the verses we're gonna look at today are a little bit different. See, before he addresses any of these heresies, uh, he's gonna start by, by bringing encouragement. Have you ever noticed when you read the letters that Paul writes, there's kind of this theme you see often, we call it the sandwich method, right? because we like to eat, right? So the sandwich method, he starts out with some encouragement, right? That's the top piece of bread or the bottom piece of bread, I guess. He starts out with some encouragement and some you know, praise for what God has done and, and, and just kind of, hey, I, I'm so thankful for you, thankful for what God has done. And then he like drops the hammer, right? Like he's like, and here's where you screwed up, right? Like here's what's gone wrong. Here's where you're sinning. Here's where you're making mistakes. Here's what you need to kind of clean up. And then at the end, he goes back to like, 
encouragement and we're praying for you and we're believing God for you. So we see that in this letter as we see in many other letters. And so the scripture verses we're gonna study today are gonna deal with more of that encouragement. And so let's pick up in verse three. He says, we always thank God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love that you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learned this from Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow servant, who's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And he has told us about your love in the spirit. So we see Paul starts with encouragement and prayer and thankfulness. And I think this is kind of amazing because like I said, Paul had never been to this church. Paul had never visited this church. We never read about him stopping in Colossae, ministering, like he heard about them. How, how many of you have like maybe pastors that you like to listen to their sermons online or things like that? You've never met them in person. Like I got a couple pastors that if people ever ask me, hey, what's, what's a good person to listen to for some good Bible teaching? I'll, I'll give you recommendations, right? Like there's people that I listen to that I've never met I've, I've seen them teach in conferences. I've heard them preach. I listen to their podcasts. I love the, the technology that we can be able to do those things. I would say that they're kind of like a spiritual mentor to me without actually ever being a mentor in my actual life, right? Like I, I listen to them. I trust them. I love listening to how God speaks through them in his word, but I don't know them. I think that for these Colossian Christians, this would kind of be how Paul was to them. They, they had heard about him. They knew uh, the ministry that God was doing for their life. They never met him, but he might've been like that spiritual mentor, somebody that they looked up to. And all of a sudden this mentor that they looked up to is writing a letter to them. And he's saying, listen, man, I heard, I've heard all the great things that God is doing. I heard about your, your faith that you have in God, that you have a real faith, a life-changing faith, that you have a true love for all the saints, that you guys truly walk this out and you have a true hope in, in eternity that's rooted in the hope of the gospel. The, the work that God was doing, had done and was continuing to do in Colossae was undeniable. Paul notices it. Paul, Paul is grateful for what God has done. The same gospel that was being preached all over the first century world that was making this massive impact and changing lives is the same gospel that they had experienced and that they were still experiencing in their city. And then the next couple of verses, these are the verses we're gonna really focus in on today. Verses nine through 14, Paul's going to share in response to the thankfulness and gratefulness he has for them, what he is praying for them. He is not only gonna say, hey, I pray for you, but he's actually going to show them what he prays. Here's the prayer I have for you in the midst of all that you're going through. Here is my prayer for you. And so look at verse nine. It says, for this reason, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We're asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." You know, what an amazing prayer and, and, and a, a glimpse into the heart of, the, of the, the pastoral heart of the Apostle Paul for these Christians that he had never even met. These Christians who were dealing with the temptation to compromise. These Christians who were being bombarded with all these other thoughts and ideas and these things that were needed to be added to the gospel. These, these Christians who were dealing with the temptation to, to, to say, okay, well, maybe Jesus isn't enough. Maybe we need to have these other things. They're dealing with all these temptations and here he gives them into a glimpse into his heart and his prayer for them. And his main message of this prayer is, listen, I know the gospel's transformed you. You have faith, hope, and love. And so my prayer is that you would continue to walk worthy of what you've experienced. That's what I wanna talk about today. What does it look like for us to walk worthy? Now, to be clear, when I talk about walking worthy, we're not talking about something that we do to make ourselves worthy. This is not a, a works-based salvation. We're not talking about, hey, because of what we know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what I need to do to make myself worthy of the gospel. I'm going to, to work on myself. I'm gonna make, my, no, that's not what we're talking about. That's not what Paul's talking about. In fact, in 2 Timothy 1, he says this, he says, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life, a set apart life. He did this not because we deserved it. Everybody, you need to hear that. It's not because you deserved it. 
Not because you were an A plus student, everybody else was terrible and he wanted you on his team, he needed you, you're the best of the best of the best. No, 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 no. If anything, the gospel shows us that we are not the best. Not because we deserved it, but because this was his plan from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. To walk worthy is really, it means to walk in a, an authentic and effective way in Christ. It's how we live our lives in response to what Jesus has done for us. It's, it's what the Bible talks about, living your life as a life of worship, holy and pleasing to God. That's what he's talking about when he talks about walking worthy. And Paul focuses on the four characteristics or four traits of this worthy walk that should be apparent in every life of a believer who is walking worthy. And so I wanna talk about those things today. And so the first thing, if you're taking notes, he talks about is we need to continue to grow in the knowledge of God. A person who is walking worthy, according to Paul in these verses, and who is living a life that is pleasing to God is a person who is growing in their knowledge of God. God wants us to know him more and more. He wants us to know more of who he is, his nature, his character. He wants us to grow in our knowledge. Paul writes this to the church in Philippi in his letter also written around this same time. He says this in Philippians 1, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep Keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. In other words, the more that we know, the more that we should grow. Knowledge and growth are, are actually together. And we should be constantly growing as followers of Christ. You understand that? How many of you know that when you became a follower of Christ, the moment you, you invited Christ into your life, you surrendered your life to him, you became a follower of Christ. How many of you understand that at that moment, you didn't arrive? It was like you woke up the next day and you're like, I feel, honestly, there's a lot of change. I'm perfect now. Right? We, like it's, it's a journey, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a process. The Bible calls it sanctification. It's a, that lifelong process. On this side of eternity, it doesn't matter how long you follow Jesus. You can be a baby Christian, new believer Christ. You can have been following Jesus for your entire life, right? 60 years into this, you still have growth to do. There's always gonna be something that God wants to work on, motives of our heart, actions of our lives. There's always gonna be things that he tries to work on in our lives. On this side of eternity, we will never arrive, but we should be continually growing, continually maturing. In 1 Peter 2, it says it like this. It says, like newborn infants desire the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow up or mature into salvation. Like this is, this is a beautiful picture it's painting, right? Like a baby needs milk in order to grow. That's what brings nourishment. He's saying, you as a Christian, you need the word of God in your life. You need to be rooted, established, built up in the word of God because that is what grows you and matures you into that spiritual maturity. If this, we say it all the time, if coming to church on Sunday and, and hearing the word of God is the only time that you, that you have a meal in God's word, you're not gonna grow. Like th this needs to be the, the, the start of your week, but this can't be the end of your week until next Sunday. You need, you need God's word throughout the week. You need to be digging in on your own. Like, like infants need milk, so you need the word of God so that you can mature into your salvation. How many of you have kids? I mean, if you can, maybe your kids are, are no longer babies, but the, the picture we, we get here is like, how many of you can remember, if your kids are not babies, you can remember back to when they were babies. Like I have four and uh, my youngest is four, my oldest is 11. And, uh, and so we're past that stage, the, the sleepless night stage, you know what I'm talking about? Maybe when they become teenagers, you go back to sleepless nights, I don't know. But we're past like the sleepless nights and, 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 and poopy diapers. We're actually probably closer to having to wear diapers ourselves, apparently. Um, but we're past the, the baby diaper stage and... Uh, but I can remember when all of our kids were, were little babies. I can remember the way it worked in our house is this, is that, that Tiffany was in charge of the feeding, right? That was like how it worked in our house. She, she fed our children, but, but I helped in the ways that I could help. And so the way it worked in our house when our kids were babies and they would wake up in the middle of the night crying, I would go and get them out of their crib and I would bring them to the changing table and I would prepare them to get what they wanted to get from Tiffany, right? I could not give them what they needed, but I could prepare them. And so I would change their diapers. And if they, you know, had a blowout or something in the middle of the night, anybody had, like that's like change that whole situation, right? I would do whatever needed to be done and bring the baby to Tiffany. And every once in a while, cause my child and I love them, I would like lean down while they were on the changing table and just, you know, snuggle into them and give them a little kiss. And without fail, every single one of my kids in that moment, in the darkness of the room, when I would lean down to give them a kiss, 
would try to latch onto my nose. <laughs> you ever had that? It's like a cruel joke for that kid. Like this is not going to give you what you're looking for. And it was, and it was like, I'm sorry, I will deliver the message. I know what you're ready for, but I, this is not it, right? There was only one thing that they needed in that moment. There's only one thing they wanted in that moment. There was only one thing that was going to satisfy them in that moment. And I didn't have it. And it's saying in the verse, it's saying like, like an infant only finds their nourishment in that. And that's what they crave because that's what they need. So we, as far as Christ, we should have that same type of desire and craving for the word of God. We need it. But listen, just like a baby grows and matures and eventually is no longer like breastfeeding, it'll be like a little weird. If like, how old's your kid? Oh, 14. Then why is that happening? That's weird. All right? Oh, how many months is your kid? 444. Like, that's weird. It's weird. You went to that. You mature, right? See, listen, second service, you get all the unfiltered stuff, right? This is, this is not in the notes, extra. Don't listen to any of these things. But I'm just being honest, right? That's weird. Like, and so at some point you have to mature. At some point you have to continue to grow. At some point you have to get past the, 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 the milk stage and move into solid food. And some of us, we, we've been Christians for a long time, but we're still wearing diapers for some reason. And we're still, we're still desiring a, a diet of milk when we should be. And, and Paul, like he talks about this. He addressed, the Bible addresses this in Hebrews chapter five. It says this, it says, there's much more we, should, we would like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You've been believers so long, that's blunt. You've been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again, the basic things about God's word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. At some point we have to grow, we have to mature. We can't stay the same. And so are you growing? Are you growing in your knowledge? You know, one way to, to really know if you are growing, the one way to really gauge that in your life is to look at your obedience. Because truthfully, the more that you know God, the more that you trust God, the more that you believe that God is good and loves you, what's gonna follow is obedience to his commands, obedience to what he says. You trust him and you believe him and you follow it up with your actions. Your actions are submitted to him. This is what the Bible says in 1 John 2. It says, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is, why, that is how we know we are living in him. And so we can look at our lives and here's a really simple way. Not only have you arrived, but are you growing? So meaning like, do you still struggle with the same things you struggled with 10 years ago in your walk with the Lord? Or are you walking in victory? When you look at God's word and you read God's word and you see something in it and you look at your life and you realize that the way you're living your life doesn't line up with what God's word says, well, what do you do? What's your response? Do you look at it and go, that's for somebody else. No, that's, that's too hard. Or I don't like that about God's word and so I'm gonna change it and change what it means. Because if that's our response, we haven't matured. Our response should be, okay, God's word, does it, what, what I'm doing and how I'm living and the choices I'm making, the relationship I'm walking in, the things I'm doing in that relationship, it doesn't line up with the truth of what God's word says. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna submit every area of my life unto God because he is not only my savior, but he is the Lord over everything. And I'm gonna sub submit myself to his lordship and his leadership, even when it's difficult because obedience shows that we truly know God and trust God and are maturing in God. And what he says first, if you're gonna walk worthy is we should be growing in our knowledge of who God is. Number two, we're called to be fruitful in good works. We're called to live fruitful lives, meaning we're called to be people who bear fruit, bear fruit in our lives that shows we have received Christ, shows the heart of repentance. James 2 says it like this. It says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. That's just your spiritual gift, right? He says, show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, I want, I want you to understand because sometimes these verses can be distorted or taken out of context. I want you to understand what is and what isn't being say, said here. What's not being said here is this, is that your works save you. 
That's not what he's talking about. Your works, our good works are not what saves us. But what he's saying is our good works show that we are saved. And here's what I'm saying. It is possible to do good things and not actually be saved. How many of you met a, a person who does not know Jesus and does nice things? They can be generous at times. That it's, it's all about karma, right? Like I'm just gonna do good things and then good things will come to me. The motiva- they can, you can do good things. You can live a, a, a decently good life. You can do moral things. You can not cheat on your spouse. You can pay your taxes. You can not give somebody a, the finger every time they cut you off. Like you can do good things and not actually be saved. But here's the reality. It's not possible to truly be saved, to truly have saving faith in Christ and it not be lived out in your actions. It's a spiritual impossibility, the Bible says, to actually have real faith, but that faith not be lived out in what you do. It, to profess with your mouth, but not live with your actions is impossible. That's what this verse is saying, that you, your, your actions do not save you, but they actually show that you are truly saved. It's a way for us to look and be like, am I living the right way? Am I bearing fruit that shows that God has actually transformed my life because it's gonna be apparent in my actions. Last week, we talked about John 15, right? We talked about the vine and the branches and and how Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and we're called to stay connected to him because apart from that connection, we can produce nothing. Well, a little bit later in those verses, uh, Jesus says this in John 15, eight, he says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, which brings great glory to my father. When we live a fruitful life, a fruit bearing life, we prove that we are truly disciples of Jesus Christ, that our faith is genuine. It brings glory to our father. And I love how Paul uses the illustration here of a fruit bearing tree and not just grain, because the Bible uses the illustration of grain and and wheat and stuff. And listen, I'm not a farmer, right? I'm not going to pretend like I, I, I've told you before, I I had a garden once and it was not good. It was not successful. But here's what I do know. I, I know that when grain grows, it's then harvested by being cut down. And it has to be planted again. Seeds have to be planted. It has to basically start from scratch each time. And I love how he uses a, a tree here because a tree doesn't have to be replanted to be fruitful. Actually, the more mature a tree is often, the more fruitful it is. The more it grows, the more it's nourished, the longer, the more fruitful it is each season as it is growing and maturing. And not only growing and maturing, but sometimes it's through the pruning that leads to greater fruitfulness. And we can preach about that because sometimes, right, what leads to greater fruitfulness in our lives, there's, there's things in our lives that are competing. There's things in our life that are competing for, for fruitfulness. And sometimes there's things in our life that are actually robbing us. We're maybe fruitful in things that have no eternal value or significance, which is keeping us from being fruitful in the things that actually matter. And so sometimes because God is a good gardener, he has to remove certain things. And how much, pruning can be painful at times. It's not always easy when things are cut away, but sometimes it's through the pruning and and the removal of things that ultimately, even though it's painful, leads to greater fruitfulness in our lives. And ultimately the end result, the end desire is that we would bear much fruit, that we would be more fruitful, that everything we do would bear fruit in in line with the righteousness, in line with the change that God has made. And, uh, And here's what I want us to see. These first two things, these first two kind of points or first two elements of walking worthy are, are so intertwined. Like they are, they are impossible without the other. That, that bearing fruit is a direct result of knowing God more and more, growing in God more and more. The more we know, the more connected we are, the more that we understand who he is and we trust him, the more fruitful our lives will, will be. They go hand in hand. And so the third thing we see is this then. When it comes to walking worthy, the third thing he talks about is being supernaturally empowered by God for patience and endurance. In order for you and I to walk worthy, right, we need to be empowered by God. This is not anything that we are made to do in our own strength and power. We need a power that is above and beyond ourselves. I like how Paul says it in his letter to the Ephesian church, Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. Again, remember, he's writing all of these things from prison. And he says this, he says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. The same power, the Bible says, that raised Jesus from the dead, that overcame death in the grave. The same power that Jesus had, the Bible says, is available to us who are in Christ Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? How amazing is that? 
a power that overcame what had up to that point been undefeated. It's not like Jesus died and came back to life and then died again. He overcame death in the grave once for all time, never to taste death again. And the Bible says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that overcame what was up to that point undefeated is, is the same power that's available to you and us in Christ Jesus. And Paul tells us in these verses why we need that power. He says to, that you would be strengthened by God so that you can have the patience and endurance you need. Ultimately, here's the thing. We talk about this a lot is just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean your life is gonna be easy. If you became a follower of Christ because somebody told you, listen, you just give your life to Jesus and you get a get out of hell free card, right? And you get a life that is full of, you know, butterflies and rainbows and cupcakes and, you know, gain weight, right? Everything is perfect. You love Jesus, that's it. Like on, on this side of eternity, that's not true. On the other side of eternity, that's true. But on this side of eternity, life can be hard. Life can involve trials. And just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean you're immune from those things. We're gonna go through trials. We're gonna have periods of testing. We're gonna have temptations as we see in the book of Colossians that are there. But what he says is you need God's power to have the endurance and the patience you need to persevere, to continue to walk forward. That's what we need. That power, the Bible says, is so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do and to be who God has called us To be in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 36, it says to do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward that it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you can continue to do God's will. Then, then you will receive all he promised. Often the promise is on the other side of obedience. The promise that we experience, the promises of God are on the other side of our patient endurance in the midst of our trials and temptation. And some of us, we miss out on the promise because we give up during the trial. And listen, if you're in the midst of a trial and you're trying to do it in your own power, in your own strength, you're you're gonna give up. You're gonna fail. And that's the point. You're not meant to do it in your own power, in your own strength. What does Paul say? He says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Like we often need to get to the end of ourselves, the end of our rope, because it's at the end of ourselves, the end of our rope, where God's power works greatest. His power works greatest in our weakness. So Paul says, I'll boast in my weaknesses because when I am weak, then I am strong. You don't need more of your power. You need God's supernatural power to give you what you need to endure, to have patience and endurance. And then the fourth thing he talks about when it comes to walking worthy, he talks about joyfully giving thanks always. To walk worthy, to live a life that pleases God We need to be people who live joyful lives full of thankfulness. And I've read this verse we're about to read time and time again. If you've been here for any period of time, you've probably heard me read these verses. I love these verses because they're short, memorable, and challenging. And we need to be reminded of them often. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do you notice that in that verse, what it says, all of these are choices that we have to make. They're not the result of emotions, our feelings, because how many of you know, you don't always feel joyful. Like you, you might be like, man, I'm gonna have a great day. And then your alarm clock goes off. And like, oh, I gotta go to work. Never mind, this day's terrible, right? Like it, or how many, of you, this is, how many of you ever had a dream? And you woke up angry at your spouse because of what they did in your subconscious. Like, why are you so mad? You're like, you better, your dream self was a jerk last night, right? Like, joy is a choice. It's not based on what you feel. It's not based on your emotions because if you're basing it on what you feel, well, something's gonna happen real quick in that day that's gonna try to steal your joy. So you have to choose joy. He says to, to never stop praying, which means we have a choice. We don't pray once. I prayed once this week. I I prayed at church. Everything else is covered for the week. No, we never stop praying. We're thankful in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. That's not what he's saying. He doesn't say every time something bad happens, thank you, Jesus, for that person that cut me off. Thank you, Jesus, that my, you know, my dog died. Thank you. No, it's not saying be thankful in all circumstances. We can still be thankful even when things are going bad. Why? Because we're not focused on the circumstances. We're focused on the God of the circumstances. 
So I can be thankful in all circumstances. Why? This is God's will. In Philippians 4, it goes on to say this, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds everything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You notice we experience God's peace when we do these things. He says, when we choose joy, when we choose to rejoice in the Lord always, when we choose to worship instead of worry, because those are really our choices, when we choose to pray instead of panic and allow our hearts to be full of anxiousness, when we do these things, then we experience his peace. His peace doesn't often come before we do it. His peace comes when we make the choice to do what he calls us to do, to choose a joyful attitude, to choose to worship God no matter what is going on around us, to choose to pray and give it to God and allow him to bear our burdens for us. When we choose those things, then that peace that goes beyond all understanding floods our hearts and guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And this is what it looks like according to God's word, according to Paul, to walk worthy. We live out these characteristics. Now, I wanna read one, one other verse in the book of Psalms because I really think this kind of is going to bring home where we're going. Psalms 103 says it like this. It says, let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. I love these verses in Psalms because it really goes with the last couple verses we looked at today in Colossians 1, verse 13 and 14. And the reason I love it is because we've been talking all about the how, right? How do we walk worthy? What does it look like for us to walk worthy of God? And the how is good, it's important. But what's more important than the how is the why. Because the why motivates the how. The why we do something, right? How many of your kids, that's the question they ask all the time, why? Right? Well, the why is what motivates, why am I not supposed to do this? Why am, why am I grounded? Why is this happening? Like why motivates the, the how? And so what we're gonna see, what we see in the last two verses in Colossians 1 and what we see in these verses is the why behind the how. Why should we walk worthy? We'll look at verses 13 and 14 one more time in Colossians. It says, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the son he loves. In him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so two things we see as we, as we land the plane. And if you've been here a long time, you know land the plane is a figurative. We're like, it's not, it's 20 more minutes. No, I'm just kidding. We're gonna be landing the plane here in a second. The worship team, this is when the worship team comes up and is like, are you gonna end ever? No, this is that moment. Why we walk worthy. Number one, we see in this verse is the reason we walk worthy is because we've been rescued from darkness and brought into the light. That's what he says. Like a, like a hostage negotiator who trades his life for a hostage, Jesus has rescued us by trading his life for our freedom. And the Bible says he's rescued us from the world of sin, the world of darkness, the kingdom of this world. And he has transferred us, brought us in to the kingdom of his son. First Peter 2.9 says this, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The reason, the why that we are called to walk worthy, first and foremost, is because we understand that we have been rescued and delivered from the sin that once enslaved us, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of this world. And he has brought us in to a brand new kingdom, the Bible says. In Ephesians 5, it says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. For the light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness. Instead, expose them. The Bible says that when we are in Christ, we are now citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Our citizenship, first and foremost, is to the kingdom of Jesus. That's good news because, listen, we, we are American citizens, but the kingdom of America will eventually fade will eventually be gone. But the kingdom of King Jesus will never fade. 
And so sometimes we need to remind ourselves where our allegiance lies first. He didn't save us and make us Americans. He saved us and made us Christians. He saved us and redeemed us and brought us into the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom that is unshakable. We are citizens of heaven. And so the first reason, the first part of the why, why we walk holy is because we have been rescued from the kingdom of dark and we have been brought into the kingdom of light. And the second thing he talks about is this, that we are redeemed and forgiven. And both of those words are significant words. They're powerful words. They carry with them such spiritual richness. To be redeemed is a powerful word that means to be released from a captive condition. It's a a word that means the emancipation from slavery. Forgiveness implies the act of freeing from an obligation or punishment. It's a pardon or a cancellation of a debt that was owed. It's not like God just forgot about it. Okay, you did all these things wrong. I'm just going to turn. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus did. He didn't turn the other cheek and say, I'm not going to, I'm going to pretend like you never did any of these things. He said, I'm going to pay the penalty that you owed for that. That's that's what redemption and forgiveness means. It's redeemed through his blood. That the the payment that you and I owed that we could not pay for ourselves was paid. It just wasn't paid by us. It was paid by Jesus. In Ephesians 1, 7, as we close, it says this. It says, in him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Would you stand with me today? I love that phrase. The riches of his grace. If you're in Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, this is, this is the reality of what Jesus has done for you. I heard somebody say before, you know, grace is just, it stands for God's riches or God's righteousness at Christ's expense. Grace is a big word. It's a powerful word. It's a word that I think even as followers of Christ that we can follow Jesus, we'll never fully understand the depth of what that word means. I think his grace is beyond our ability to fully comprehend, but it's, It's all about the riches of his grace that this has been made possible for us. Your redemption, your forgiveness, your being brought into a new kingdom has nothing to do with anything you've done. That's important. That's like, that's the place we have to start. We have to constantly bring ourselves back to that. No matter how long you follow Jesus, no matter how long you've you've been living your life for him, there's nothing you have done that has brought you near to God. There's nothing you have done that's, that's, that's made you a worthy person of the sacrifice of Jesus. There's nothing that we can do for that. It's not about your worthiness. It's about his greatness. It's about his love. It's about his grace that has been poured out on us who do not deserve it. And so when we talk about why we should wanna walk worthy, why we should wanna live a life that is a life of spiritual sacrifice, a life of worship, well, the reason why is because we constantly bring ourselves back to the, the why. That Jesus did for us what we can never do for ourselves. He saved us. He redeemed us. He for, he's forgiven us. He's made us new. He's adopted us and brought us into his family. Like all of those things, they motivate, they motivate the action. So the question I want to ask you today is we close, maybe just close your eyes for just a moment. Because I think it's important for us at times to just do a little bit of a heart checkup, Right? And so the question I want us to think about today is for those of us who are here who are followers of Christ, are we walking worthy? As we think about our lives and we think about some of the traits that that Paul talks about, the actions that should be a part of a life that is walking worthy, are those traits that are seen in ourselves? Not perfection, but are we continuing to grow in our knowledge of God, continuing to grow in our love of God, continuing to grow in our obedience? Are we living fruitful lives, bearing the fruit of good works, not to earn God's love, but in response to his love? Are you living a spirit-empowered life that is supernaturally empowered by God with the patience and endurance you need to walk through every trial, temptation, and test? And are you living a life of joy, joyful, joy-filled thankfulness? Here's what I'm believing. I'm believing that over these next eight weeks as we study this book together, God is just gonna bring us back to the basics. And we're gonna see time and time again that it's just about Jesus. That Jesus is all we need. He is all we have. And he is enough. Maybe you're in here this morning and you don't even know Christ yet. 
You may have been in church your entire life. You may have gone through confirmation classes. You may have been baptized as a baby. It's a wet center, honestly. None of those things really matter. What matters is the relationship with Him. Outside of that, it's just empty religious motions. It's just our attempt to, to earn our way to God. So maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ and the, and the action step for you before we leave this place today is simply to surrender your heart to Jesus. To surrender your life to him, to say, okay, you're my savior and my Lord. Save me from my sins, forgive me from my sins. But also I want you to be the Lord of every area of my life. My life is in your hands. For some of you, that's just the, that's the simple step that you need to take. You need to draw the line in the sand, stop kicking the dirt, say, okay, I got them all in trust you. I believe you. My life is yours. And as we close in prayer today, if that's you, I want you to just pray. There's no magic formula, no certain prayer you have to pray. You just have to surrender your heart. Stop trying to do it in your own power and trust Him. God knows your heart. He knows, regardless of the words you speak, He knows your heart. And so, as we close in prayer, you're like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray. It doesn't matter. Because God knows your heart. So it could be a simple, a simple I surrender, God done trying to do it myself but before we before we pray is there if there's anybody in here today i just want to know i'm praying with you we always want to give this opportunity before we close so if there's anybody in here today who say yeah that's me i need to surrender my heart to jesus i need to, to give my life to him would you just raise your hand right now i'll look around for just a moment i want to know i'm praying with you just give this opportunity very quickly i see that hand anybody else today decision you ever make in your life. As I said, as we close in prayer, if that was you, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know that's you, I just want you to just to pour out your heart to God as we close today. For the rest of us, maybe we're here and we are followers of Christ, and when we look at those things that Paul talks about when it comes to walking worthy, we realize that there's some areas that, that we need to really submit to the Lordship and the leadership of Jesus Christ. That's what we call the conviction of the Holy Spirit not condemnation, not saying, okay, you're never going to be good enough. You're not really follower of Christ. You're just worthless. That's not the voice of Jesus. That's the voice of the enemy. Conviction is an invitation, we say, right? It's an invitation for us to go, okay, God, what I'm doing and how I'm living is not lining up with the truth of your word. So I'm going to submit it to you because your God's desire for me is that I walk close to you. I walk in relation with you. It's an invitation. Because listen, God's ultimate desire for your life is that you would know him that you would understand his will, that you'd be confident in your calling. So if there's an area that we looked at today, surrender to him. And I'm also say this, at the end of the service, if there's an area you, you need prayer, we want to invite, we'll invite some of our prayer team partners to go to both sides here. If you have prayer, we don't ever want you to leave this place without taking time to pray with somebody. We believe in the power of prayer and that we're called to bear each other's burdens. And so if you need prayer, please don't ever be embarrassed by that or hesitant about that place of prayer. This is a place of healing. This is a place of, of love for God and love for one another. So make sure you do that as well. But Father, today we thank you for your word. Thank you for, for what we're going to study as we look at Colossians over these next few weeks. God, you're so good. God, we're so grateful that we have your word to guide us, to lead us, to transform us. That you haven't left us in our own power to try to figure it out on our own. Lord, you've given us your word. So God, I pray that you would challenge us. Pray for, for anybody who raised their hand, who even right now in this moment is, is praying to you, crying out to you, surrendering their heart to you, God. I pray that this is a holy moment for them, a moment that they look back and remember. The beginning of a journey with you. And it is a journey, God. It's not like you're gonna wake up and everything's perfect and nothing, no mistakes, no, but you're, you work on us. And so I pray that we would be open and submitted to your working in our lives. It doesn't matter if it's a person praying this prayer right now for the first time or a person who's followed you for their entire life. Lord, help us to not just declare with our mouth, profess with our words, but God, help us live it out in our lives. God, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Jesus' name.